Hey, it's me, Jen again, and today we'll meet a Wisconsin surgeon who's saving thyroids through RFA. I'll introduce you to Dr. Robert Brebick, coming up. Welcome back to the Surgeon Series. Today's guest typically performs thyroid surgery several times a week, but when he became familiar with thyroid RFA, he was intrigued to find a better solution to the problem of treating thyroid nodules. Our area that we service is quite large geographically. I mean, it goes all the way up to Lake Superior. One of the bigger impediments when I've had people that would qualify for this is the fact that insurance doesn't cover it and just some people just don't have the capability or the willingness to pay for it out of pocket. What's your experience with that in your group? We've seen it all. <laughs> so for me in particular, uh, being at a hospital, they did file on my insurance, and I'm not sure why, but my insurance did cover it both times. <laughs> no. I don't know if it's because it was medically necessary, but we have seen patients who have appealed to their insurance companies and been successful. Some patients who their doctors would file, but then they would get denied. We've seen others where the provider has been denied so many times that they've just stopped trying until they know, for, you know, more likely that it will be covered. It's interesting because I was told that, you know, just basically it won't be covered. And so that's not yeah. something that we've pursued. We haven't submitted any claims, you know, even though it's FDA approved, my understanding is that, you know, insurance can dictate medical necessity. So I can right. say something's medically necessary, but it doesn't mean that they will have to abide by that and they can make that definition. It can be reasonable or unreasonable. In some cases for other things, it's quite unreasonable. And, you know, we will fight that. I've even had things go to administrative law judges, interestingly. And I mean, they're not really medical people, but I, we haven't really considered trying to submit it, but maybe that's an, an option. One thing I did want to mention, you mentioned the, the code. Um, the code that we see a lot of patients mention that is used is 60669. It's I think a catch-all endocrine code. And we've had patients say that that's a code they used and it was covered and some say that it was denied. So I really, I think it is, as you said, up to the insurance company to determine uh, what they think. We've had patients submit appeal letters with studies citing you know, all of the positive benefits of this and the fact that if they were to have a total thyroidectomy, you know, the insurance company would be covering the cost of the surgery and the medication for the rest of that patient's life. And that when they look at that cost benefit, you know, side by side, sometimes they do cover it for those reasons as well. It depends on how squeaky the wheel is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's that. And it's also the insurance company, the market right. and kind of who you're talking to. Because I remember in one day we, we call it a peer to peer review. So not for this particular procedure, but a different procedure, what the insurance company will have a physician, not necessarily a surgeon or anybody in that specialty, but in a physician who will look at their policy and you'll appeal. And so then you get to talk with them. I had two different patients on the same day, the same insurance company, same problem. And that I talked to two different reviewers and one approved it. And the other said, there's no way we're approving this. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, I mean, there's a certain subjective to it as well. Certain things they'll dig their heels in where they might pay for, say, a lab test for a certain thing. There's never any issue. And then all of a sudden they'll all kind of get on the same page and, and quit paying for it. On the other hand, if it's something really new and they're just not used to seeing it, you might be able to convince them. Uh, we haven't thought about going that way, but I, I'm going to try. I'm going to talk to our billing people. I'm going to try it. And the only issue there will be, do we try that as a pre-approval thing before we do it, which is generally how you approach these things and try to get permission. Probably that would be the way to go. Because usually once you do something, if they don't want to pay for it, they're kind of off the hook. They're just going to say, no, you didn't ask permission. So, you know, you go through the process and you say, yeah, we can do this and it's reasonable. And, and then the but here's the bottom line. I mean, it's going to cost us much money. And, and then the folks, and you're right, it's way cheaper than surgery. Exactly. So if you, if you, even if you go to the you know outpatient surgery center and have a hemithyroidectomy, but if you have anesthesia, pathology, mm -hmm. surgery center, surgery fee, I mean, it's going to, it's several orders of, you know, it's going to be five times as much as the 
Exactly. Even yeah. if you have the insurance coverage of that procedure, for example, I have pretty decent insurance. My deductible is, I'm going to say it's like $2,000. And that's low now. You know, that's yeah, been a, yeah. that's been that's a seismic good. change. You know, people don't talk about that, and so we're self-insured, and, and I feel bad about it. But our our deductible is uh, like six thousand right. dollars, and but it's a lot of out-of-pocket expense. Exactly. That out-of-pocket expense, whether you're doing surgery or this, is going to come either way. Exactly. For, for me, I never meet my deductible. Like here it is, November. I still have not met my deductible for this well, year. That, you're young I, and healthy. You're young I, and healthy. <laughs> Well, thank you. We're, we're meeting it every every year now. So, except for the years that I had RFA, I've never met my deductible. And mm-hmm. for people who have a higher deductible, say six thousand dollars, if they were to have the surgery, they would still be out of pocket that six thousand dollars, and then you know whatever medications they need and whatnot. Versus if you have the RFA. Yeah, we charge less than that. You know, we're brand. You're going to be out the same <laughs> amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the probe is, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand, and in this building we have an angio suite, so we have nurse sedation. So like you'd have an endoscopy, and you'd get some Versed and fentanyl, and then you're comfortable and you're not yeah. anxious. And so I, we most people can't do that that are offering the RFA, but we can do it, and I I think it contributes to a better experience. So yes, you know that's kind of you know. So I have. I have a sedation nurse and a circulating nurse. We were just, we were charging 5,000. I actually feel bad about it, but. I mean, I've heard some places offer it for up above 7,000 and a very few have charged less than 5,000. But I think that those have some kind of special circumstances and I'm not sure exactly what they are. But back to your comment about the sedation, I absolutely think patients will find that appealing. I had sedate, conscious sedation with both of my procedures. I was fully awake and fully with it, but I was extremely comfortable. I right. was not anxious. I felt nothing, but I was able to converse just like I'm conversing with you. That's exactly and, that's uh, exactly how we do it. Yeah. yeah. It makes a tremendous difference. We've seen some patients who complained that maybe they would have liked to have had some sort of anxiolytic to help with their anxiety because they do feel nervous about what's going on, which I mean, rightly so, you know, (laughs) they have said that some of them would really prefer or even not want to pursue the procedure if they couldn't have something like that to help with their anxiety. Exactly. And I think most places that, well, this is an office-based procedure and they just, they don't have a setup that can allow that. Exactly. We're fortunate We're fortunate that we do. If it was me, I'd want to have a little something probably. And as the operator, I don't mind. If, I mean, if the person is just more relaxed and the whole thing is, it just makes for a better experience for everybody, you know. Absolutely. I was reading a little bit about you and I saw that in one location, it said you're an internist, and then I saw also your general surgeon with vascular surgery experience. Is that correct? Yeah, so I did an internal medicine residency and okay. at the University of Iowa, and I never practiced internal medicine, but I finished and I'm board okay. certified. I practiced in an ER for a year, so I did ER medicine. Then I went and I did general surgery, so board certified general surgery, and I practiced in a rural area in Iowa, And then I came back to Wisconsin. At that time, I'm old enough where that was the the evolution of vascular fellowships. So not all people who did vascular were fellowship trained vascular, but I, that was the majority of my practice actually. And then I did some additional training and angiograms and stents and things like that. And we were kind of early adopters here in the early 2000s of that. So I did general surgery and vascular endocrine surgery. So I kind of had a real diverse practice. About two years ago, I quit doing vascular. We have five fellowship trained vascular surgeons. You know, I just, I'm busy enough doing my general surgery and the primary part of my practice is endocrine. So in my group, we're the largest private practice surgery group in the state. And I'm the only one that does the thyroid, parathyroid surgery. At the hospital, I do the vast majority of it. So that's my background. I, I'm not a pure endocrine surgeon. In fact, when I went through, I don't really know that there was like an endocrine surgery fellowship available. You know, I've been in practice in surgery since uh, 97 or something. Every week I do three to five thyroid surgeries, you know, the, all the typical things and then parathyroids as well. And 
And so looking at this RFA, it really seemed like, a, you know, there was a group of folks that really could benefit from that and that it was a reasonable technology. You know, I'm old enough and I've been through enough things in medicine where you'll see some things come and go and some transient right. enthusiasm for a certain technique or procedure and then it doesn't pan out. You know, one of the sayings in medicine is you don't want to be the first to do something or the last to do something. I generally agree with that. And on the other hand, I thought this was something we should bring to Wisconsin. I didn't get to go to Korea and, and train. And in this time of COVID, can't really go somewhere. You know, I met with a surgeon from the ENT surgeon from Hopkins for a day. And I think the one advantage that I have is that, you know, with the vascular procedures, I've done thousands of angiograms and those are all ultrasound guided needle based access procedures. So that was not like a stretch. I've had my own ultrasound in the office for years and years, very familiar with that. And as a surgeon, you have a certain advantage over non-surgeons in terms of the anatomy. And, you know, I think that I had all the pieces that would allow me to do this. And then we have a, this really nice facility where I can do nurse sedation. This is the kind of thing where like yourself, there's certain people that look for it and you just want to be available to them. But that's, that's my basic background. So like the primary part of my practice is endocrine surgery. I still do general surgeries. In our group, what we've tried to do is like get people to focus on certain areas. This is my niche here. When you're having a thyroid surgery, it's very important that you have a surgeon who's really good at that and specialized in that area of the, the body. And what I wanted to ask you about the vascular experience that you had is, do you, as a vascular surgeon, do some of the interventional radiology type things in those procedures and does that like help you that knowledge help you with rfa in the thyroid yes in the sense that for inter, you know the interventional guys you know they do a lot of percutaneous interventions that say vascular surgery doesn't do you know different biopsies and tubes and stents and drainage procedures they also do vascular and venous intervention the way it evolved at this hospital is the majority of the arterial vascular work has been done by the surgery group you know my vascular interventions are mostly endovascular okay. mostly arterial so that's like putting a needle in an artery and you know then a, a sheath and and then doing some type of procedure usually with a blockage with opening that up in some form the overlap is the access where you're ultrasound guiding puncturing things and i think that there's an overlap with the thyroid because you have to be really conversant with the ultrasound hand coordination and Right. And, and so when you look at this, I, you know, it's IR, it's surgery, general, endocrine, ENT, and some endocrinologists. I think the my background, you've done 500 carotid endarterectomies in the neck and all kinds of vascular procedures. And then I've, you know, done hundreds of, of thyroids. And so in terms of the anatomy and stuff, it's very much familiar. And then in terms of the ultrasound puncturing needle thing, it, you know, it's something that we've been doing for 20 years. So yeah. it kind of it kind of came together that way. Hey, I was wondering about you because you had such a big thyroid that, you know, if they did that all through one puncture, if they had to move up and down. And Yes, the very first one, he passed through one um, puncture, but my neck, like I said, was really swollen. And he said, yeah, we passed through the strap muscles multiple times uh, treating this big old thing. But the second time, he was really trying to get to the slower part. And so, yeah, he, did, yeah he did have to go. He, he did, you know, the standard transismic approach. But then he did also have one other to the side. I did feel a little bit more kind of referred pain in the collarbone area from that. It still was not bad at all. You know, as you're talking, I was thinking, boy, that was a big thyroid. <laughs> so, I, you know, you want like to see you, a you picture? Know, I'm think yeah, I'm thinking of some other patients. It'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time, you know, how the envelope gets pushed and this was after the allergic reaction. I had that that really big lump right there. Yeah. And then this was a few years earlier. You can see it was just kind of this little bulge off to one side. That was after my pregnancy um in twenty 16. This was actually before the allergic reaction. It was just really sticking out in that one particular picture. This was in the ER. 
I went oh. into the, I went to the yeah. ER because I was just really struggling to breathe and swallow. Uh, this is about two weeks after my allergic reaction. Like I kept choking and panicking. And so I called my husband. I said, you're going to have to take me to the ER. So this black can tell that's my airway. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, compressed and pushed off to the side. And then this big golf ball thing here is my nodule. That was me at the hospital after my procedure. You can see my neck's a little swollen. Three months later. Wow. Pretty pretty different <laughs> yeah that's amazing and uh and then six months later i had the little indentation starting to reappear it had not been there for a long time this is when i had my second procedure at uva this was this summer so you can see there's there's collarbones there's a little indentation there i lost 30 pounds but my neck circumference only shrunk like an extra quarter of an inch from that Okay. Um, otherwise, my neck shrank three and a half inches. <laughs> I think that's an amazing. He did a great job. Well, you mentioned that the physician at uh, Hopkins, Dr. Tufano. Yeah. Yeah. They started an organization called the North American Society of Interventional Thyroidologists, or NASIT for short. They do webinar series there to educate physicians and, and like advanced techniques and stuff. There's another group that's endocrinologists, North American Society of Interventional Endocrinologists. The webinars are amazingly informative. Even for me as a layperson, physicians trading their, uh, their case stories and techniques. I'm getting a lot more out of this than you are. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. You know, you were talking about your location and I saw you are located super close to the Canadian border, <laughs> you know, relatively speaking. We actually have quite a few Canadians who are like, where can I get RFA in the United States that's close to the Canadian border? Because, you know, they don't have access to it at all in Canada. They would have to come down through Minnesota. Mm -hmm. or, or across through the UP, through the Sault Ste. Marie. It's a little less populated up there. Yeah, bring on the Canadians. Yeah. Um, Some of them even go overseas to like South Korea, Austria. I interviewed a Canadian who was in Toronto. He couldn't get into the US because of COVID restrictions at the time. Yeah. He went to Austria and had his treated over there. He had thyroid cancer actually treated. It was less than one centimeter. Oh, it was a small um, papillary. Okay. It was a small one, but he was, I want to say 40 years old, didn't want to lose his thyroid, you know, healthy guy, was just very concerned about the surgical um, outcomes, which, you know, that's a common thing. Patients just don't want to have to rely on that medication for the rest of their life, especially when they're younger. So many patients in the group wanting to find this. It's very patient driven. Um, yeah, that's for sure. It's very, it is very patient driven, but I think it's, it's reasonable. My perception was it's not going to be one of these procedures that's going to fade with time or that will be discredited with time, I think it's going to be one of these procedures that's going to expand with time. And you definitely, there's definitely people that want it. Everybody has a different perspective. Occasionally they'll meet somebody and they're like, listen, I just want this out of here. You, right. know, you know, and I'm like, well, I can do that. That's fine. And, you know, here's what that's going to look like. And here's what your experience will be. And these will be the consequences. You know, we see a lot of people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis who have yeah. coincidentally other thyroid issues, you know, so they may already be on thyroid medication. Now, it's nice to have your thyroid, even if you need a supplemental medication. I say it's like pedaling a bicycle, you know, so if you're making some and you have some auto regulation, but you need some additional, it's kind of like you're pedaling a bike uphill and you get to the crest of the hill and you need somebody to give you a push. But you're yeah. doing a lot of it on your own and that's probably a good thing. It's a fussy medication to take. You know, there's, it's not just taking a pill, but it, a lot of things interfere with it, as you know. And some folks find it hard to, to get the right adjusting dose yeah. on that. I'm excited about the RFA. I think maybe we haven't done the best job in terms of the money part of it because we just say, well, there's no insurance. But maybe we could, we have our own insurance department with employees. So we should be able to do better there, I bet. In fact, I'll meet with them next week. I mean, we were going to sit down next week and kind of look at this again, like, because I think we've sometimes not done a great job of giving people the information. In fact, so I just said, listen, don't, I don't want anybody talking to these folks. Just give me their number. I'll call them and, oh, wow. uh, and not give them like misinformation. So yeah. I think, I think we, we can do better in terms of bringing those people in and, and helping them get 
what they need. But do you have any people in your group that have, I mean, I'm sure you have other indications. You mentioned that fellow with this small papillary. Have you had many folks with autonomous nodules that go through the RFA? Yes. Of, yeah. What's your experience there? So we've seen, we've seen kind of a mixed bag. Um, we've seen some who their levels just get totally back to normal. Yeah. And then we've seen some who they can lower their methemazole. One particular patient comes to mind, I think she's had two RFAs. Her nodule yeah. was quite sizable. And she was able to bring down her methemazole quite a bit, but she could not come off of it. But, you know, less is usually preferable to more. We have seen more patients with the non functioning nodules than the hyper functioning ones, but it is very interesting how different the outcomes could be. It, it's not quite as consistent. Yeah, my, I mean, in reading the literature, you know, mostly overseas literature, that, that mm -hmm. the fit, you know, the requirement for repeat treatments is probably 50%. And you might need, you know, two or even three. So I think uh, it's definitely, it comes down to how motivated the patient is, how much they want to be able to avoid a surgery or radioactive iodine. I mean, and the fact that this is something they can try and it's not I hate to say it's not permanent, not in the sense that they won't get permanent benefit, but in the sense that if they don't find the benefit to be good enough, then they can have surgery and do radioactive iodine. Yeah, and that's what I've told people. It doesn't burn any, you know, what I like is it is it doesn't burn any bridges. So I haven't operated on anybody that's had a RFA. You know, like say if you do surgery, somebody's had a parathyroid operation, but then you go back in and you have to redo something. It it can be quite difficult. There can be a lot of scarring and there's just an increased risk of a nerve injury and technically more difficult, easy when there's it's a de novo, you know, first time surgery. So doing the RFA, everything is kind of inside the thyroid. So technically you shouldn't have any, you know, external inflammation. And that's my understanding is that that it doesn't make a subsequent surgery harder. So I like that. I mean that's a positive. And you know, I've, I've spoken with a lot of physicians. I have not encountered one yet who has had to do surgery on a patient after the fact. Yeah. So that's encouraging. Being that you are a surgeon, you know, that's your bread and butter, is what was so interesting to you in particular about RFA that you wanted to take it on, even though it is not surgery? It is an intervention. It is invasive. It's really how you treat a problem. It's a different solution where you want to get a certain result. And it has advantages, as we've talked about, you know, the preservation of thyroid function, the avoidance of a scar, the avoidance of a general anesthetic, and a quick recovery. Uh, and it has the advantage of if for some reason you needed to, you could repeat it. And, and also that there's always the option of surgery down the road, should that be necessary. So I think that it's more looking at the problem and how to solve it and not so much, well, I'm only going to do surgery. That's what happened there where when angiography first came out, it, they really had no interest in it because it wasn't an operation. And then as it evolved and it was solving all of these anatomic problems, people realized, hey, that's kind of in my wheelhouse. I know the disease. I know the anatomy. It's just a different way of getting the same result. I want to use that technique or that technology. Surgery is great. And maybe there's something wrong with surgeons that they went into surgery and it's a socially acceptable form of like getting in there. On the other hand, what you want is you want the best results with the least intervention. So that's like laparoscopic surgery. The first, when I first started my general surgery residency was the first week they did their first lap coli at that hospital. And I thought, oh my gosh, surgery's destroyed. I mean, we can't like cut things open and take them out anymore. This is really going to stink. But I mean, that evolved into a whole, that's area. And now there's people trained who probably don't know how to do open gallbladders. It didn't phase me at all. In fact, it's, it's intriguing to try to find a way to do something better. I like your perspective on that. My particular experience when I went to my local ENT, he was just very, very adamantly against RFA. And I was like, well, why? Because I, I viewed it the same way that you do as, you know, this is just a different way to take care of this problem. It's a less extreme way. I think he was just very much not interested in seeing the different way. And part of my experience with him that was also very disappointing, I 
presented to his office and I was all excited because I thought now I've had this procedure. He's going to be like, let me be, you know, the guinea pig. And he was mad at me. He was not excited at all. He looked at my thyroid ultrasound and he just freaked out when he saw the difference, the changes that happen on ultrasound. You know, if you're not aware of what to expect, I guess it can be, maybe you can speak to that. Is it, is it scary looking to see well, that on ultrasound? You know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, to me, that's really the only like concern I've had is like as as we go forward, we'll have a group of people that had this intervention that's going to change the appearance of their thyroid. So this won't be a, a typical looking thyroid nodule. Some of these will look kind of funky and they might to the uninitiated person be concerning for say a malignancy or some, you know, I don't know how these would be graded out. You know, there's a system of grading these thyroid nodules and, you know, radiology won't recognize it. And um, so I, you know, give everybody an information card. I had this treatment on such and such a day. This was treated, this nodule, this is how it looked. And then try to document the follow-ups. So, I like that. but that's a big part of the discussion. And I'm curious how this is going to be in five or 10 years. And to me, that's the only real negative. There will be a residual lesion. There will be at least a scar, if not some residual nodule. And this will show up on ultrasound. These are benign. So the goal of treatment you know, is, is symptom relief. And, and all we want to do is shrink this. But inside, there's still going to be something that you can see on ultrasound. So I'm not saying I'm concerned about it, but it's really on my mind how this is going to be in five years or so. And I, I try to educate and prepare them that if, you know, to, if somebody might look at this and be concerned. Is that resonate with what you're seeing? Yeah, I really like what you were saying about you give your patients documentation that shows what they've had done and, and the date and everything. I think that is an excellent idea because what we don't want is for patients to, like you said, they go to their ENT because they're having GERD or something right. and an ultrasound and they're like, oh no, you've got thyroid cancer. I can see it right there. And I think almost, you almost need like a card, like if you get a pacemaker and it says yeah. I had this implanted in this date and you keep that in your wallet, you know, people don't always remember. They'll have an ultrasound and they'll forget to tell anybody and then they won't remember the details. So I think we need to do a good job of giving them documentation that's portable. I think that is an excellent idea. And I think it might help, especially as more time passes the untrained physicians to be able to collaborate with those who have done RRFA, you know, maybe they, they see this card and think, oh, I, maybe I'll call that doctor and ask him about it. And even though, you know, a lot of physicians are starting to learn about this, there are still physicians who don't. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Tofano is, there's really no room for paternalism, that you may not perform a procedure, but as a physician or a medical provider, it is incumbent upon you to know about the procedure and that if a patient is asking about it and even if you don't perform it, you shouldn't dismiss it. And that is something we see across the board with patients. They come to this group and they say, my doctor says this procedure is bad. I shouldn't do it. We spend a lot of time helping educate patients about the real facts about this because a lot of the times they've, they've been misadvised by someone who just doesn't know. It's good to be able to show them, this isn't just our experience, this is not anecdotal. These are documented studies and research that we can show you and that you can then take and show your physician if, if need be. So yeah, there's doing... all kinds of reasons, you know, there's people that it's like maybe your ENT experience where it's scary because it's a terp thing, like maybe he's going to lose cases. Right. You, know, you know, sometimes you don't agree with things and yeah. I don't think this is one of those things. And you're right. I mean, the paternalism thing you have to really be careful about and you have to meet people where they're coming from and try to understand that and address, you know, that person's needs in total. What's your experience been like in doing this procedure? Have you had any cases yet? I wish I had more. I mean, you know, a half dozen. Uh, I've had a lot more inquiries. Everything's mm -hmm. gone very well, but I think part of it is our system. Like for a while, like we actually had people calling and my receptionist said we didn't do it. If you can believe that. That's so common, actually. And I'm it like, please, 
I tell people if they need a second treatment, we'll do that for free. I mean, for their initial consult, it's a it's an endocrine surgery consult, so you can bill that to insurance. This has been hard to onboard. It's just people don't get it, and we keep trying to educate my own folks. And so I think the biggest impediment for me has been like my own people, and maybe that's on me. So what I'm trying to do is like from now on, I just talk to folks directly myself when they call for questions. And then the money thing, I've had a number of people that that I think would be good candidates, but then when you talk about that, they don't they don't want to do it. And I think we should probably take a different approach to the insurance. So I like your suggestion of the codes. I haven't done as many as I would like. Everything's gone well. I feel comfortable doing it. I think you would have scared me a little bit with your nodule. Probably. I probably would have scared most of the physicians I've interviewed, to be honest. Uh, so I think that was impressive. So I can't say I've done 50. I wish I could, you know. Um, that's the other thing is I'm super honest with the people. And I'm like, this is how many we've done. I think you are being super hard on yourself for multiple reasons. For, for one thing, your office staff not being familiar with this, that is super common. We run into that a lot. We have a list in our group of all of the known providers in the U.S. and also another list of overseas providers. And I can't tell you how many times a patient will come to the group and say, I called Dr. So-and-so's office and they said they don't do this. And if you start that process for the patient and they get denied, the patient can come back and appeal. You'd be surprised. We've actually had several patients who, once they appealed it, the insurance company was like, okay. One particular patient even appealed, I wanna say three times. We have documents in the Facebook group written by patients citing the research. One patient in particular even, and she mentioned, because she used to work in insurance, that you will consider reporting them to the local, what is it that she called it? Um, well, there's the insurance commission in each state. You could report them as not being willing to cover a medically necessary procedure. She said once she did that, everything was fine from that point on. We really go around with the insurance companies quite mm -hmm. a bit. It depends on the company. They'll just say this is an unlisted, this is an uncovered benefit. You yeah. know, and that's our policy. It doesn't matter what you say. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter what your reasoning or the papers you support. This is, this is listed as uncovered. Mm -hmm. And that's a non-starter. Or they'll say it's experimental. And they won't even let you have a peer-to-peer and then if you do have a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, a lot of times then they kind of go back to these. They said, listen, doc, I understand what you're saying. I actually don't disagree with it, but like these are the rules and this is what the, the, the person signed up for when they bought this product. It seems like you're less able to sway them. Not that we don't try, so we do. But, uh, but I'm, all right, you've reinvigorated my desire to go and fight. Oh. So we will do this some more. <laughs> I have been inspired by, by yeah. just your tenacity on that. I think what we'll do is we're going to retool how we do this and we'll try to submit for approvals. We'll see what happens. And I think that will help bring it to more people because there's some people, I agree with you, like they're going to pay 5000 regardless. But yeah. like if you're a Medicare patient, that's not the case or a Medicaid. I mean, we see everybody. We've had a few patients with Medicare get coverage. Oh, really? Yeah. I wonder, I wonder though, it's probably Medicare Advantage. So, you know, there's two kinds of I don't Medicare. Know. So, you know, there's straight Medicare, which traditionally there isn't like a pre approval process, but now for some things just recently there is. And then there's Medicare Advantage, which is Medicare being administered through a private insurance company. And it's like Medicare and private insurance had a baby and it's a mutant and it's called okay. Medicare Advantage. What they do is it's Medicare paying. You know, so for the provider, you get paid like Medicare, but then you have to go through all of these pre-approval processes and uh, denials, just like in private insurance. So their goal is to not pay for stuff. And also it's not really portable. So you have a network and, you know, preferred providers. So if you're like a retired person and you want to travel around, it's not a good product. So I wonder if these guys uh, who had Medicare, it was probably a Medicare Advantage plan. The one patient that's coming to mind right now lives in Georgia and she went to Virginia for her procedure. Yeah. And it was covered by Medicare. She must have had straight Medicare then, otherwise she wouldn't that's, have been able to that's go. That's kind of what I was thinking. If you have straight Medicare, for most things, there's no pre-approval. So you, as long as you meet their guidelines, and they, they can deny things after the fact, I'm going to have to go back and we're going to have to dig into this. And I just saw a Medicare lady. She has an autonomous nodule and, it, and she has a yeah. lot, a lot of drug intolerances and she doesn't yeah. think that she can take even the the thyroid medication. And so we're probably yeah. going to do this. You know, I think that's definitely 
it makes sense for patients like that. You know, my particular case was, was similar as far as my intolerance to drugs. I was very concerned about having to go on drugs for the remainder of my life. The, the whole reason I got in this mess was because of a, a drug allergy. Now, if you look to the list of drugs I'm allergic to, it's like, yeah, you should never have surgery because most of them are antibiotics. If I ever had a post-op infection, I'd be in big trouble. I just saw a lady back today and she had a papillary thyroid cancer, but she, you know, her allergy list is literally 20 medicines. And, mm. you know, some people poo-poo that, but it's like, I'm old enough to know that do that at your peril because like usually these folks, there's something with their body or their immune system or they react to all these different things and so even like her skin prep before surgery i gave her a sample i said just try this on your arm so we know and she called me so now i got this rash and you know everything we give her like a little test dose but that's amazing that it. you're willing to do that for her though because so many doctors wouldn't do that they wouldn't go to the extra trouble oh well yeah but i mean it's real and and yeah. if you ignore it you're only like making matters worse for everybody oh, wow. what do you think about because you are a surgeon i wanted to ask you this too do you see a potential for patients to have a combination of surgery and rfa say one side needs to be removed and they want to preserve the other side but maybe it's got a nodule in it do you that's see a great, that that's a super interesting question and i and i think i could definitely see that it just reminds me of endovascular i mean like so you do open surgery and you do vascular endovascular things and sometimes you do combos in the same surgery you know you might put a stent up in the iliac artery and then do a bypass down below and, and there's no reason you can't mix and match you it's the problem you want to solve the problem in the right. best way it'll be really interesting you know you know medicine there's some exciting things about it hopefully i'll stay in the game long enough to see how this works out but <laughs> i think it's going to be a positive for people like i said it's a little dangerous to be the first one but on the other hand i mean after really studying it i thought this is legitimate and um so yeah let's get on it thanks so much for watching subscribe and ring that little bell so you don't miss the next video in the surgeon series you can help others tremendously by sharing this content. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own health advocate. Now, watch this next video right here.